In my last Southwest video, I expressed excitement for Southwest's announcement that they would start flying to Chicago O'Hare. While some other content creators have expressed skepticism, I firmly believe this is a big move for Southwest, and will pay huge dividends. Always one to put my money where my mouth is, I flew exactly two weeks after the inaugural flight, sorry folks, I got a day job, you know, from Phoenix to Chicago O'Hare. How was it? Well, it felt very much like a work in progress, or a knockoff Southwest experience. And that's not Southwest's fault, but rather O'Hare's. What do I mean by this? Let's find out. I'm actually going to do this flight review in reverse, since it's the arrival at O'Hare that's worth talking about, and I watch the audience retention numbers. And apologies in advance, but I don't even have much footage at O'Hare. You'll soon see why. Terminals 1 and 2 are run by United, and 3 by American. And Terminal 4 doesn't exist, so Southwest was only able to snag some gates at Terminal 5, the international terminal. I've mentioned the issues of Terminal 5 before. Flashback. The Terminal 5 infrastructure is simply insufficient for a good ground experience. It's old, and the number and quality of concessions lacking. End of flashback. Let's talk about the pros and cons. Con. Terminal 5 is not connected to the CTA Blue Line. I'd say you could take the people mover to the other terminals, but that boondoggle is still not open two years overdue at this point. Con. Terminal 5 has no dedicated TSA pre-check line. They will hand you a card that lets you keep your shoes on, but laptops and liquids have to come out. Ugh. Pro. There are not one, but two priority pass lounges in Terminal 5. By contrast, there are no lounges at all at Midway. This is big news for Southwest passengers. Con. Unfortunately, it's such big news that there's no way that when travel resumes you'll be able to get into these lounges. Overcrowding was already an issue for years, and adding Southwest passengers will only further add to this overburden of access. Con. Terminal 5 isn't really set up for domestic travel. The double-decker nature of the terminal encourages people to go down through immigration, so some shepherding was required to exit. The gate area on this level wasn't even marked as Southwest anything, and we were escorted out at 11pm so I couldn't film. There's also not much infrastructure for domestic baggage claim, only a single belt for all flights, and oversized luggage was just a guy and a closet. As you can see, things are pretty evenly split, <coughs> not really, on being in Terminal 5. I'm sure that if Southwest had a choice, they would much rather be in Terminal 1, 2, or 3 if there was any gate space. I would much rather they were as well. But Southwest's plan was to get their foot in the door at O'Hare, and they sure have. After the five initial routes launched on February 14th, 2021, love for Valentine's Day, get it? Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! They've already added two more routes as of March. So, during a pandemic, on a two week old flight that flies twice daily to an airport, most people don't even know they serve yet. I was expecting an empty flight. At least, that's what another content creator told me to expect. There's nothing left at O'Hare in regards to innovative and profitable new routes for them to focus on. But my flight was full. 100% completely full, all 143 seats. Oh, but perhaps it was just cannibalizing the existing 5-7 to seven flights a day between Phoenix and Chicago Midway. Chicago is just Chicago after all, right? No. The flight to Midway departed only five minutes before the flight to O'Hare. And it too was 100% full, I checked. That's not cannibalization. What makes Southwest's expansion to O'Hare so important is that it serves two purposes. Increasing capacity, Midway is slot and gate capacity constrained, and broadening the market to residents of the north and west sides of the city who think Midway is too far away. 
let's consider some other examples. Miami and Fort Lauderdale airports are only 26.6 miles apart, but many airlines, now including Southwest, serve both airports, and I think there's little argument that they serve different markets. Washington Dulles and National Airports are 37.2 miles apart, but anyone in their right mind would prefer DCA. Wake me when the Silver Line makes it out to Dulles, I've already been waiting decades here. Similarly, DCA and BWI are 36 miles apart, and American and Southwest happily serve both. United might love Newark Airport for long-haul flights, but they still happily fly into LaGuardia 24.6 miles away. Only 10 miles away is JFK, yet both Delta and American fly both there and LaGuardia. Or perhaps closer to home of a certain spotter, the distance between San Diego Airport and the CBX Tijuana Airport Bridge Crossing is only 23.5 miles. True, you need to pay to cross the bridge, but in a similar situation, the airport in San Diego is slot and gate constrained, so there is a market for additional flights nearby, even if it's across the border. Why did I list all these other cities with multiple airports? Well, the driving distance between Chicago O'Hare and Midway is 26 miles, right in the middle of these other examples. And like most of these other examples, driving distance doesn't tell the whole story, as there is often well over an hour and a half of traffic and no direct link by public transportation without a connection downtown. And this isn't some abstract thought experiment. Delta has been serving both O'Hare and Midway, albeit in a limited capacity, for years, and it made sense for them to do so. So Southwest, the largest domestic U.S. airline wanting to get access to the third busiest U.S. airport as of right now, that's not crazy at all. Okay, let's get to the actual flight review now. I arrived from Page, Arizona on a separate Contour flight in the morning, and had all day to kill in Phoenix. Oh sure, I could have booked an earlier flight on American, but where's the fun in that? Instead, I spent the day in Scottsdale, enjoying the warm weather, window shopping, and eating tacos. Returning to Terminal 4, I headed to the dual lounges of the Centurion and Escape Lounge. With the Amex Platinum card, you can access both, though only one each day. Which one should you visit? Well, whichever one lets you in first, frankly, as both days I was there, there was a wait list. The food is exactly the same and comes from the same kitchen. In these COVID times, you have to order remotely, and the portions are absolutely tiny. The food was mostly good, but not as good as the other Centurion lounges, my opinion. The sandwich in particular was quite poor. The seating in the Centurion Lounge was more varied, there's slightly more premium alcohol, more exclusive clientele, and it has a better view of the American Gates, so I guess it gets my vote between the two, but you frankly can't go wrong with either. I previously gushed about flying Southwest during COVID with flawless boarding and blocked middle seats. This was not that. Southwest still on paper has the best boarding practice, with only 10 people at a time. But rather than lining up, there was a second pack of people, and the gate agents didn't police it at all. See, this is what Southwest boarding is supposed to be. And here is what my gate looked like. Hey, guys, guys, I'm in the line here. What, what are you doing? The 737-700 is pretty standard to me at this point. 32 inches of legroom with free messaging and streaming entertainment. One oddity of the flight was the fact that they were clearly still working out the kinks of the schedule. Southwest flights normally are constantly flying all day, turning around quickly before taking off again. But this aircraft had sat on the ground for four hours. I don't know if it's due to lower demand due to COVID or poor route planning but it was an unexpected inefficiency for sure. The other thing Southwest needs to figure out are the airport codes. Sure, you can't search for flights from both airports during a single search, but this also means that they are considered different cities when it comes to rebooking. When my flight from Midway to Texas was canceled earlier, 
I was unable to change to a flight out of O'Hare and vice versa, both online as well as over the phone. This is clearly an IT limitation, one that Southwest needs to fix if they fly to multiple airports here and in Houston. Flying time was 2 hours and 42 minutes at 39,000 feet. COVID service is streamlined, just a bag of pretzels and water, but I covered that in my last video. The captain made a note of the fact that this route was only two weeks old, thanking us for choosing it, and joking that it felt weird and he'd try to remember to land at the right airport. And indeed, it did feel weird. We passed the downtown facing east, very close to the downtown, flying right over Grant Park, and swung around to line up with O'Hare. All of the buildings downtown were dark, perhaps due to the fact that nobody was in any of them. And there is your proof, a southwest wing led right at O'Hare. Taxi was quite long all the way over to Terminal 5. I'm not sure whom Southwest got the gates and slots from. Wow? Norwegian? One of the other airlines? But I was pleasantly surprised to see Southwest moving in with multiple aircraft parked overnight. Deplaning wasn't that great when it came to social distance. No announcement and at 11pm everyone just wanted to get off the plane as fast as they could. I didn't even bother filming it. So Southwest at O'Hare. Yes, even with no marketing, it's clear Southwest can fill the planes. My seatmate said she'd just seen Southwest coming to O'Hare on the news and that's why she booked it. No advertising required. Yes, the ground experience is inferior to Midway, or even to other O'Hare terminals. Yes, American and United will absolutely fight back. But Southwest has a following, one that can't simply be bought or dismissed. They'll put up with a lot for the customer-friendly policies. And I get the feelings that Southwest isn't going anywhere at ORD. Give them some more gates and a better terminal, and American and United are right to be very afraid. Because they should be. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click that button and please subscribe for many more flight reviews to come. I'll see you on the next one.